Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I'm so excited about this episode. I have on the show the one and only Dr. Paul Copan. Uh, Paul has a PhD in philosophy from Marquette University. He's a Christian theologian, analytic philosopher, apologist, and author of over 40 books. He is currently professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University in Florida and holds the endowed Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics. Um, he's written a ton of great books. The one that, well, the, the two that we're going to talk about on this podcast are to are um is god a moral monster which i read 10 years ago and it was so good so helpful dealt with a lot of problem passages in the old testament and he has a forthcoming book coming out in the fall called is god a vindictive bully. And so we talk about several problem passages in the old testament the conquest of canaan the mauling of the kids with the female bears in second kings 2 if you might know that passage we talk about um some of the passages, statements on on women in the book of Deuteronomy that are difficult and other problem passages. So um, yeah, I'm so excited about this episode. Paul is a wonderful uh, Christian, a serious student of the Bible, and I just I learned so much um, in this conversation. So please welcome to the show the one and only Dr. Paul Copan. All right. Hey, friends, I'm here with uh, Paul Copan. Paul, you, this is long overdue. I've been wanting to have you on for a while. Uh, really excited to have this conversation. Um, yeah, thanks for giving us an hour of your day. This is, I really appreciate it. Sure. So uh, your book, the, I first came across your name 10 years ago uh, with your, I, I, don't know, I don't know if it's your first book, at least the, well, the first one I read, Is God a Moral Monster? Um, is that your, that's not your first book, is it? Or is it? My first book was in 1998, True for You, But Not for Me. I've, I've done about 40 books, so, um, oh, so that gosh, one okay. was <laughs> in the middle uh, is, of things. So, is is I would is is God a Moral Monster? Is that the most popular book you've written that has gotten the most press? Or yeah, I would say so. That's uh, been the been the most. Um, yeah, I, in, in fact, I'm when I'm asked to speak, I'll speak on moral monster type themes about 75 percent of the time. That's okay. sort of the kind of the default yeah. uh, asking, uh, you know, can you speak on this topic sort of question? So, yeah. Well, here, just for people who don't know about this book and in my audience, I, I think they do get it. Well, they get excited, but also frustrated, I think, because I'm always recommending books. I'm always having guests on um, that. I, I don't do this for promotional purposes, but just because usually I have people on who have written a book who is whose book has been really helpful for me. And so we talk about it and then everybody goes out and buys, buys the book. But um, yeah, this, I, I, I cannot more highly recommend this book. So um, is God a moral monster deals with a lot of the problem passages in the Bible in, in the old Testament that make seem to make God out to be a moral monster. Like, um, I mean, a big one is the treatment of women, which your chapter on that is incredibly helpful. You have one, two chapters on slavery. Oh, you do have a chapter on slavery in the new Testament. You've got, um, three chapters on the killing of the Canaanites, God hardening people's hearts, the, the, the food laws. I mean, these are all like the big ones when, when people read the old Testament, they're like, Oh, what do we do with this? So, and then you have a new book coming out. Is God a vindictive bully, which I obviously haven't read yet, but deals with other problem passages. So I, I guess my, I want to start by asking what has, what motivated you to dive into these kind of passages that were you in your own faith journey, kind of like, wrestling with these passages? Was it your students or what, what motivated you to dive into this? Well, I grew up in a pastor's home. And so these were passages that I read, uh, you know, and was exposed to, uh, from childhood. And so, but there were obviously moral, uh, questions uh, to wrestle with in, you know, especially as you get into your teenage years, you start to wrestle with these things. But, uh, you know, I, and I have a background in biblical studies and theology, undergrad and graduate. Uh, and so this has been a, a, an area of exploration for me. But what really kind of launched this uh, was uh, that I wrote an article called Is Yahweh a Moral Monster? It was published in the journal Philosophia Christi. Uh, and it was motivated by a lot of the bad press that the Old Testament God was getting, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and others, uh, who in the wake of the September 11th attacks were not only lashing out against Islam, but all religion as being uh, mm. poisonous and uh, dangerous and so forth. And uh, in particular, the the uh, treatment of the Old Testament uh, understanding of God was, uh, was in there, definitely in their sights. And so I utilized uh, the actual 
uh, you know, some of their assessments uh, of the Old Testament God as my chapter headings. Uh, in fact, is God a moral monster? That came from Richard Dawkins. Is God a vindictive bully? That came from Richard Dawkins. So there, you know, there is something redemptive about those uh, new atheists, uh, yeah. at least in this regard. Um, so, uh, so anyway, but I've, uh, you know, so I, I wrote that article. It was well received, and then I developed that into the book uh, Is God a Moral Monster, which you know then came to look at the old issue of violence or you know warfare in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, and I teamed up with Matt Flanagan uh, to write a book called Did God Really Command Genocide? Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been doing a lot of work in these areas. I have some other book chapters coming out that deal with Old Testament warfare and some of these ethical challenges in the Old Testament. So, so it's an ongoing project. So why don't we just dive into one and see where this leads? I mean, there's I, I would love to talk through all of the all of these. I'm looking at your table of contents, and then your new book has all the passages, the the mauling of Elijah. What do we do with that? With Uzzah touching the ark and he's struck down. Like you just hit all of them, all the ones that. And and to be honest, Paul, like so I've got four teenage kids, and um, my third daughter, super smart. If any if anything catches her in the Bible, that's like, whoa, wait a minute, what's and all the ones you do deal with are all the ones that we've wrestled with. And sometimes my response is convincing. Other times she's like. Nah, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't buy it yet. Why don't we start with the Canaanites? Okay, because this is kind of sure. the, you know, the ugly uh, passage in the Old Testament, or at least, you know, nothing's ugly in the Bible, but I mean, it's a passage that throws people for a loop. Did God really command wholesale slaughter of an entire people group? And what do we do with that? Right. Well, of course, there's nothing that, uh, you know, when it comes to the people themselves, uh, there's nothing inherently uh, deficient, problematic, uh, immoral with these people in themselves. There's nothing tribal uh, that sets them apart from other people. Peoples. It's simply their behavior that uh, these people who are uh, being judged uh, through the Israelites are engaging in acts that would be considered, uh, you know, you know, criminal in any modern society. You know, um, bestiality, uh, ritual prostitution, infant sacrifice, incest. Uh, these are practices that are associated with these people, and God warns the Israel Israelites not to get caught up in those practices. Uh, and so, and also God. God gives 500 years, uh, over 500 years of, of warning that he's going to wait until their sin is completed. So it would have been wrong for the Israelites to go in prematurely. Uh, and, uh, and and so God waited until the time was right. And of course, uh, uh, so so it's, it's not inherent to these people themselves. Uh, also, we need to keep in mind that this is seen as an act that is justly punished. Uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 11, that Rahab from the city of Jericho was not, uh, you know, was not uh, punished with the rest of those who are disobedient. Namely, uh, there, there's a culpability factor that is involved here. Uh, and in fact, as we read in the book of Joshua, there are people who are, if they're willing to, uh, you know, apart from fleeing, if they're willing to align themselves with God, who and everyone knew. Uh, Rahab knew 40 years before there were reports coming out of Egypt uh, that the that the Israelite God had defeated the, the Egyptian gods and had led them out through you know after plagues in the in, in Egypt led them through the Red Sea and so forth pillar of cloud by day fire by night uh, over the camp of the Israelites so anyone who is you know, mildly curious would know what's going on with the Israelites and that their God is is uh, a powerful God uh, who is even greater than the greatest superpower of the day namely Egypt Egypt. So there are people, you know, Rahab signs up, uh, the Gibeonites uh, through trickery uh, align themselves with the Israelites. There are people who are Canaanites in, in chapter 8 of the book of Joshua, these strangers who are actually listening in and in Shechem to a covenant renewal ceremony with Joshua. And uh, unfortunately, there's the indictment in chapter 11 that none of the Canaanite cities were willing to make peace with the Israelites, which is interesting that there's a, there seems to be an openness uh, to that kind of an arrangement with other people as well, but no one who's willing. Instead, uh, the Israelites have to go, actually, they go into defensive warfare mode uh, against most of the uh, Canaanite cities. So they're actually fighting defensively once they've made an alignment with the, uh, with the, an alliance with the Gibeonites. Um, so, so anyway, uh, that's a little bit of th that sort of a setting. Uh, more in more general terms, 
than that, we can talk about the the fact that there is a lot of hyperbole that is used, uh, that even when there are a lot of Israelites, a lot of Canaanites that are still surviving, it says that one, Joshua did all that Moses commanded, uh, and we see a lot of survivors, uh, but we also see alongside of that massive hyperbole, which is common in the ancient Near East. So you can have lots of Canaanite survivors but if you, there is a, a, a victory, even a, a less than decisive one, it would build, still be seen as we, quote, utterly destroyed them and so forth. Now, uh, and even the term utterly destroyed is actually uh, been challenged by a number of commentators because that term, you know, like at the end of Leviticus in ch chapter 27, you have people who are, you know, haram, uh, they're, 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 you know, they're not utterly destroyed, but you'll know, have a, an animal or a, a servant who is har who that are haram, but they are not killed. Rather, they're consecrated. Uh, they're set aside from ordinary use and consecrated to God, say the priesthood or serving in the tabernacle or whatever. And so, so it doesn't necessarily mean slaughter or death. It just means, you know, set apart. Um, and, and, and it has to do with identity. In fact, John and Harvey Walton talk about the Nazis, uh, Nazi Germany as being a, kind of an illustration of this, where you have uh, the identity removal of Nazism, tearing down the symbols, the monuments, uh, the ideology, the bureaucracy uh, of, of, of Nazism. But basically, once that is removed, you still have the German people intact. And, and so the, the Waltons say that this is what it means to haram an identity, to, to basically remove that Nazi identity, even though you have people uh, intact. And, and that's really what you see the major uh, you know, the, the major commands in, say, the book of Deuteronomy, keep in mind, Deuteronomy is highly intense, intensified language compared to similar language in Exodus and Numbers and so forth, where the, you know, where you have ramped up language that actually includes not just utterly destroy them, leave them alive, nothing that breathes, um, but it also it will mention man, woman, young and old, the sweeping language, which is common in ancient Near Eastern, in ancient Near Eastern warfare. But, uh, but you will have that language, even though no women and children are actually present. Let me give an example. Uh, in Numbers 21, you have uh, a battle against the two kings, Sihon and Og, um, and they didn't allow the Israelites to pass through peacefully. So they take up arms against Moses and, and, and the Israelites and so they fight them, and, and the language is used. We utterly destroyed them. You know, uh, you know in other words, a decisive battle uh, was won. But in that is mentioned that the king, Og's king, you know, Og the king, his sons, and his army fought against the Israelites. So that's the kind of on-the-ground mm -hmm. account. You get to Deuteronomy 2 and 3. It recounts the same battle, but it says, man, woman, young, and old. There were no women even there. They're thrown in for rhetorical effect. It, it's what's called merism. It's using the sweeping language, uh, like you know, the heavens and the earth. The totality is a merism. Uh, or from 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 north to south in Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, you know, the totality. And same thing, man, woman, young and old. That's a merism for totality, even though women and the elderly and children were not present. So, and then again, you see the same sort of thing picked up on in uh, in 1 Samuel 15, the Amalekites who had actually initially uh, attacked the Israelites in 1448 of 1 Samuel. And then in chapter 15, uh, there's a warfare language that, you know, you see this warfare and it's at a pitched battle. It's interesting, James Hoffmeyer and others point out how in a lot of the warfare accounts in the ancient Near East, you'll have one battle that is focused on like a localized battle, which you see in chapter five, uh, the city, the citadel um, of Amalek, the city of Amalek. And interestingly, before they fight, Saul sends words to the word to the Kenites, who are also there at that at that town. Uh, he said, "We don't have any issue with you. We're we're friends, so you can go. We're going to fight against the Amalekites." So they leave. Now, surely you're not going to have women and children in this sort of a battle scene, in this local battle. So we see that there is, first of all, this localized battle. And Saul says, I destroyed, utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The narrator says that too. And 
Then you have this massive terrain. This is this is kind of the twofold rhetorical uh, device in warfare in the ancient Near East. You have first mention of a localized battle, and then secondly, you have universal conquest. So the language goes from Arabia to Egypt. Saul is fighting against the Amalekites. Well, that's clearly exaggeration, hyperbole. In fact, David fights a localized battle against the Amalekites at the end of the book. And then you see David fighting against the Amalekites in this universal conquest sort of picture from Arabia to, uh, to, to Egypt, the same terrain that Saul had fought on. So the same sorts of dynamics are, are, are at work here. So it, it's very interesting that you have a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exaggeration you know, that is, that is very, very much a part of the picture. And so what man, woman, young and old are thrown in to the mix, even though they're not, they weren't present in that, uh, in that battle site. Uh, let me say something about Deuteronomy 20. You mentioned that, yeah. and, and you yeah. have a distinction between the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the cities outside of the land of Canaan and the cities within. Well, let's focus on the cities within because it looks like, oh, total slaughter, man, woman, young and old. And keep in mind that Deuteronomy intensifies the language mm -hmm. that you know, earlier accounts are, are pretty mild on, like in, in Exodus and, and, and uh, Numbers and so forth. Well, it uses this language, but interestingly, when you look at the actual conquest of Canaan, and again, it's a rational infiltration more than like, more like, more than a, say, a, some sort of blitzkrieg. It takes time uh, for this to happen. But, uh, but, a lot of exaggeration uh, of these cities that are set apart. That, in other words, these disabling raids where the Israelites drive them out, and uh, and, and they're basically now Haram cities. They're they're not uh, literally destroyed. Only three cities are destroyed, but the rest of them are left intact. And so the they drive them out, um, kill the kings, and so forth. They're typically military install installations there. And, and what you have going on here is a lot of survivors, you read Joshua and Judges, especially Judges 1, they could not drive them out, they could not drive them out, you see this uh, played out. Uh, well, you know, if this is the case that you have for the cities in Canaan, you have a lot of exaggeration and that, you know, you, you don't have that kind of massive slaughter that a lot of people uh, have, in, have, you know, have in mind or conjured up by, the, by some of the texts. You know, if that's the case for the cities within the land, you know, think of Numbers 20, Deuteronomy 20, then it's all the less significant for, you know, say, killing all the males, uh, you know, the male soldiers in, uh, you know, the adult males in the cities outside the land. So there's a lot of exaggeration. Uh, and so it applies both within mm -hmm. the land of, you know, the cities of Canaan themselves and also the cities outside. So, so I think there's a lot more going on than a lot of people realize. There's exaggeration. There's warfare rhetoric that uh, that speaks to into these extremes. Uh, you know, even though there are a lot of survivors. Uh, in, in fact, the in fact the Jewish account, the Israel Israelite accounts, include survivors. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other ancient Near Eastern accounts, they say they don't leave any room yeah. for surviving. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, even though there are lots of survivors, typically they'll say we turned them to, to ash, we made them non-existent, and mm -hmm. so forth. So that's how those ancient Near Eastern war texts typically operate. <laughs> so much to process. And if um, if anybody's listening who has read my book uh, Fight, because I have two or three chapters on this, if you're like, wow, it sounds like. Paul's getting a lot of this from Preston. Let me to be super clear. I got it from Paul. <laughs> if you look at my footnotes or endnotes in that book, you'll see a lot of citations from Paul. So this, your your stuff, your work on this was so helpful. I, I want to um, dig in. Well, I want to say a few things about the exaggeration or hy hyperbole because that could be throwing people off. But I want to give. There's w at least one. You've given a few examples. There's another one that I think is clear biblical evidence that hyperbole is being used. So um, the Deuteronomy 20 passage, Deuteronomy 20, 16, it's, the, it's kind of like the main, or at least the one that gets the most attention kind of command where it seems like the Israelites are commanded to slaughter everybody. I mean, it says, you know, only in the cities of these people in the, in Canaan, the Lord, your God has given you as inheritance. You shall not leave alive anything that breathes. So it's like, whoa, okay. So that's, that's anything breathing, kill it. But in the book of Joshua, in Joshua 10, this is after basically the bulk of the conquest, or the, 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 the conquest of the middle part of Canaan, the southern part of Canaan, they're going to go north in, in chapter 11. But at the end of Joshua 10, 
verse 40, it says that, so Joshua struck all the land. And then it gets really specific. The hill country, the Negev, that's like the desert area, the lowland, the slopes, and their kings. And it says he left no survivor, but he utterly destroyed, that's a Haram, I think, um, uh-huh. uh, all who breathe just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. This is a clear, what I say, intertextual allusion to the command in Deuteronomy 20 or Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy 20, 16. He, he's using the very same language. Now, here's the point. We know for a fact from the book of Joshua <laughs> that there were survivors, lots of them. The rest of the book of Joshua talks about all the survivors that were left. So either here, and I've done this in class and I still, people like say, no, no, there must be another option. I said, either this verse is wrong, that there are survivors and Joshua 10, 40 is wrong. Or um, it's using hyperbolic language connected to the very command. So if since, <laughs> since, there's only, since Joshua 1040 is hyperbolic because there were survivors and because this verse is linguistically connected to the command, therefore, is it possible that the original command itself was hyperbolic? Do you have anything to add on that? And again, I might just be jacking this from your sure. book. I can't remember where I got this, but th- yeah. this is... Yeah. Because it's one thing to say, no, there's military language, it's excessive and all this stuff. And people are like, yeah, but are you just punting to that because you're uncomfortable with the passage? But here we have clear biblical evidence that there's hy- hyperbole being used. We'd love to yeah. hear. Sure. Yeah. And, and again, I, I mentioned some of this in the, in the you know, along with Matt Flanagan in our book, Did God, uh, you know, Command Genocide? Did God Really Command Genocide? And also in this forthcoming book, Is God a Vindictive Bully? I have extensive charts where I compare the, I use the language of hyperbole in one sense, you know, man, woman, young and old, et cetera. And then it, it, you know, and then it talks about others, you know, talks about lots of survivors in the next column. So side by side where there was allegedly, you know, there allegedly no survivors left. You look, uh, you know, maybe the next chapter, a couple of chapters later in Joshua, where you have those, you know, that those cities being inhabited, like the, you know, the Jebusites, you know, in, in chapter one of Judges, where you even have mentioned that they could not drive out the, you know, it says they burned the you know, city of the Jebusites, you know, with fire and so forth. And it goes on to say, it looks like you t- totally destroyed them, but it goes on later on to say that the Jebusites, city of Jerusalem, uh, that they they could not drive them out, and they are there to this day. Right. <laughs> so you have it right there. Um, so so I would I would I would mention not only that, but also, uh, as I said, the language of uh, identity removal, I think, is very critical because the focus on, say, Deuteronomy chapter seven, where it says, you know, don't leave alive anything that breathes, uh, uh, and so forth. It, meant, it gives different commands. You know, when you have come into the land, you have driven them out. Then you are to utterly destroy those who, you know, uh, who are there. Uh, you know, and, and not leave alive anything that breathes. Ha- show no mercy, etc. And then it goes on to say, and do not intermarry with them. Do not make covenants with them. Well, if you've already them out, then what are you doing making covenants with them? Why are you intermarrying with them? And then it goes on to talk about destroy their religious, uh, you know, items, their their shrines, their, you know, their, their Asherah poles, their, you know, their altars and mm-hmm. so forth. And that really is the focal point to res- to destroy those things that give the Canaanites their identity. So long as those things are in place, those those shrines and altars and so forth, that is going to be the source of temptation. But you get rid of those things, and then having Canaanites in your midst isn't a big problem because all of their identity markers have been removed. All of those things that give that, in a sense, give their religion uh, or their their you know their peoplehood its you know, its religious power have been removed. It, it's been the, the sting has been removed from that, and that really becomes the focal point in uh, in the book of Deuteronomy that that is the major major emphasis that he didn't get rid of those things that were most that made the most vulnerable, namely those religious objects, those shrines, and so forth. Um, but the Canaanites themselves, that wasn't the particular issue. In fact, they're not chided for, uh, you know, for the, you know, you know as, as time goes along, even though there are Canaanites dwelling in the land, the problem is idolatry, not Canaanites. And, and that's really what the focal point becomes. So what, how, just to bring it back to Deuteronomy 20, or, or even just the command as a whole, are you saying, I would love yeah. your succinct, maybe summary, when God says, don't save alive anything that breathes, annihilate everybody, are you saying that that is, um, that's not? A command to kill every single man, woman, and child living in Canaan? And, and if it's not that, then what is it? 
Sure. Well, I mean, you, you've already made made the point. Uh, so thank you, Preston. Uh, <laughs> you've you've already said that you know if if the language in Deuteronomy is being carried out by Joshua, and it says that Joshua carried out all that Moses commanded, but yet you have lots of survivors, then clearly something hyperbolic is in view here. That there's something more going on than just uh, you know an annihilation. A genocide, that sort of a thing. Uh, it's nothing like that. Keep in mind that you can, you know, the language of uh, of, of having a decisive victory, you know, and you know, that is sufficient to call something haram, utter destruction, okay. even if you have a lot of survivors. And, and that's what a number of commentators, you know, like John Walton yeah. uh, and, and, and others, uh, um, David Firth, uh, Lisa Ray Beal and others. So I'm not just making this stuff up. Uh, <laughs> you know, that there's, there are a lot of commentators who are coming to, coming to acknowledge these sorts of things, that, uh, that, this, that it just simply means that there was a decisive victory. And the language that can be applied to that is haram utter destruction uh, yeah. or however that's to be translated yeah and i and I, I can verify i can't repeat it off the top of my head but when i did research on haram man that opened up a whole complex window of this is a really complex word that's really hard to translate consistently in in english um because it it, it just has a yeah, some complex roots to it. So I, yeah. but in here, fact, here, it's applied. To, it's it's applied to Israel in 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 Jeremiah twenty five, where Judah is going to be. God says, "I'm going to utterly destroy you and leave your cities in everlasting desolation." Well, it only the everlasting desolation would last seventy years, and <laughs> you know, though Judah has been incapacitated politically, militarily, you know, you know, you know economically, uh, re religiously, all of these you know institutions and so forth have been you know decisive damaged as a people they still remain it's kind of like that Nazi right. Germany example that I gave and and so 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 that a language is applied to them that language of Haram is also applied to the Israelites in Deuteronomy where it's simply the equivalent of going into exile and so I bring that out in the forthcoming book is God, God of addictive bully that there are multiple ways of using the term haram it's not a uniform language of say utter destruction it has mm -hmm. multiple you know it can, it can be used in a, you know like identity removal consecration uh, exile those sorts of things smashing the paganism that was all, all over the place in the land so here's i guess a follow-up question where did israel go wrong then because the first well the whole book of judges but especially the first two chapters seems to and it's not it's it's more kind of built into the narrative it seems that they didn't actually fulfill all the commands so it, on one sense it seems like they did like they took over the land in a general way um but then book of judges the whole it's set up like ah they didn't actually fulfill the command completely or, or am i not understanding that's how i've always traditionally understood it so yeah where did they go where did israel go wrong yeah again the primary issue is the idolatry that you know in fact the the issue in judges is that they continue to fall into idolatry. Okay, um, that's true, yeah. you know, in the language in, in in judges is not you didn't drive out those those Canaanites, but you are engaging in their idolatrous practices. You haven't destroyed their religious objects. You have you know, you that these things have become a snare to you, and so you have that cycle of you know of, of the you know, getting caught into idolatry. Then they become overrun by another people and and uh, are oppressed by them, and then uh, then they cry out to the Lord, and then the Lord sends that raises up a deliverer and so forth. So that, that type okay. of thing. That's helpful. I got w one more question on the conquest and then I'm going to move on to some of these other passages while we have time. Um, it's still like, if I am honest with my, so I, I always come at scripture like, Hey, look, God's creator. I'm not, it, the problems of the Bible are really, I'm going to trust God. It's the best story told. Um, there's still issues that are like in my own flesh. I'm like, I'm uncomfortable with that, but that's probably on me, not not the Bible. Um, and I can live with that tension. So I, e even everything you said, if everything's true, it's st it, it still could feel like like the Crusades. You know, we're gonna go over and oh yeah, if they convert, we won't kill you. So Rahab, either we're gonna kill you or <laughs> convert or whatever. You know, like that still that doesn't always sit right with me. Like even if it's not wholesale. Even if we shouldn't say, you know, genocide or wholesale annihilation, it's like it's still like, oh, yeah. So if they turn to Yahwehism, then we won't chop your head off. Like, is that what do you do with that? Yeah. Or am I still not? 
yeah. interpreting it correctly? Well, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, and I go into more detail on this in the book, Is God uh, Did God Really Command Genocide, where the Crusades are largely defensive warfare. Uh, there are some abuses, but largely the, the you know, those in Christendom are simply trying to defend themselves against uh, you know, Islamic intrusion and, uh, and and being overrun by uh, you know by by you know you know by Muslims uh, you know so there so I go into detail on that so I won't rehearse that here so Crusades may not be the best example to use but when it comes to the 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 notion of um, because the Crusades weren't a matter of convert or you know or you know or or, okay. or, or else. Um, uh, but but on the other hand, when it comes to this notion of God and uh, and, and Rahab and others who sign on uh, and become part of the, part of Israel, uh, keep in mind the problem is still that the that the yeah you know, the Canaanites were at, were wicked. They were you know not necessarily the most wicked people who lived during that time, but still sufficiently wicked for God to bring judgment upon them through the Israelites, unless of course they repented, uh, aligned themselves with Israel, or of course they could simply flee. Uh, in in yeah. fact, we do have uh, you know if you do a DNA test uh, of those who are actually. Uh, living now in Lebanon to the north of, uh, of of Israel, those are the those are the forebears of the Canaanites. So they eventually did uh, migrate up uh, northward toward uh, toward Lebanon. Uh, but again, so so that sort of a, this, that sort of a scenario uh, is indeed uh, possible as well. Uh, but uh, but again, there's there's also the 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 reminder in 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 Joshua chapter eleven that uh, that no that no people were willing to make peace with the Israelites. And uh, and so there it seems like there is this you know, statement that leaves that open to 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 come to terms to making peace with the Israelites whatever the configuration was. I mean, you can still live at peace with the Israelites, but so long as you destroy the uh destroy the uh, the idols uh you know in the land, then you can live at peace with us. I mean, that's really what is being called for. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Um all right, let's. Can I, I, this might not be the most significant one, but I feel like it has come up so much in my life in the last year or so. What's going on with Elijah and the bears? <laughs> you got yeah. these kids mocking Elijah for being bald, and it seems like God, I, I don't have the passage in front of me, but God yeah, sends first, female first bears to maul these teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Am I retelling that story correctly? Or yeah. Why don't you yeah, just. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Second Kings 2, and, and of course, Elijah has just departed uh, in chapter one of first Kings. And of course, this, you know, the Baldy uh, contrast, it, you know, this is, a, it, it, it seems like an intentional contrast with Elijah, who was hairy. Uh, we're told in chapter, you know, that he is, uh, um, you know, he, he, he's, he's got, he's got the Rogaine thing going on. Um, so he's, so he's, you know, so Elijah uh, leaves, he, he goes on up and then these youths, say, go on up, probably referring to this departure of Elijah um, by the chariots of fire. Uh, and so so what 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 is going on here? Well, a few things to keep in mind. Uh, one is that these are not just little kids on the playground saying bald calling you know a prophet baldy. Uh, these are, Young, the same term is used of David, who killed a uh, a lion and a bear, <laughs> um, who is called a, a mighty warrior. Uh, this is used of his brothers, you know, in the Eliab, the big strong Eliab, uh, and so forth. So these are the these are young men. Who, it, it's a term of, used of those who are you know males. It could be adult males who don't yet have their own household, so they're not mm. married yet. Also, the same language is used of Rehoboam's. Uh, royal uh you know his friends in the royal you know household mm -hmm. uh who you know who are saying you know should you listen to the elders or should you know and and and, and rehoboam says i'm going to listen to my peers well yeah. again the same term is used these young men who are probably also have kind of a royal connection and that's probably true in uh in in for, in second kings chapter two or these boy, you know, these young men of Bethel are probably not only associated with the royal household, but also probably have some sort of a priestly connection. And, and of course, Elisha is encroaching upon uh, this idolatrous place, namely Bethel, which is a center for northern, the northern kingdom's idolatry. And, um, and what's interesting, too, is that the, the, you know, the book of Leviticus in its curses says that if you 
you know, if you go after other idols, if you violate my covenant, I will send wild beasts Hmm. so that you will be bereft of your children. And sometimes that word bereft is is translated rendered unfruitful. Interestingly, that same term is used in 2 Kings chapter 2, where Elisha has go- already gone to Jericho, and you've had the contaminated waters, and Elisha makes them pure. And it says, you know, he goes into a place that had been rendered unfruitful or bereft, and now he makes it fruitful. And so now when this prophet comes to Bethel, here should be this, this prophet should be received, and he can bring blessing to a place like Bethel, but because of its idolatry, he is rebuffed, he is mocked, and so the, these bears come out, and the, you know, the, the, the parents are bereft of their children, just as the covenant uh, you know, stipulations had promised, the curses and the blessings. So this is all predicted, mm. uh, it is anticipated, and, uh, and, and that, I think, gives a little bit more context to what's going on in Second Kings chapter 2. So these these young men, not, not youth, not like 13, 14-year-olds, but young men, um, c- could be connected to the cult at Bethel, which was exactly. ruthlessly condemned. And you're saying that their death by the bears is kind of an extension of the covenant promises, which includes blessing and curses, for mm-hmm. their connection to this really profound paganism exactly. that was going on oh interesting exactly. i okay that's how I, i've never actually looked into the passage i just have read it and i've never caught any of that stuff that's that's super helpful um okay how about uzza <laughs> okay. um this is uh what is it is it second samuel i want to say six 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 yeah. uh carrying yeah. the ark arc on a cart this one i have looked into a little bit but i'd love to hear your thoughts um carrying the ark on a cart which is explicitly prohibited by Leviticus. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, don't, if you touch the ark, you get, you, you die. I mean, that's already kind of in there. So they're doing something, carrying the ark on a cart that was held captive in the Philistine country, which even that was a whole mess. As a, or the, the ox stumbles, cart is tilted, ark of the covenant is about to fall off. He reaches up, tries to save it. Good motivations. This is where people get hung up. It's like, well, sure. he was just, who wouldn't have done that, right? Like here it comes, the ark's going to fall. What are you going to do? Just get out of the way. And he reaches up, tries to stop it, gets struck dead. Um, how do we wrestle with this passage? Yeah. Well, you've already hit on uh, a couple of things that are important to remember uh, as, as part of the context. Like you said, the, um, you know, there had to be, you know, the one, the ark had to be carried with, the, with poles through the rings in the ark. And it had to be carried by the Kohathites, uh, who were a, a subgroup of the uh, of the Levites, and so it was to be done. And, and de- keep in mind, David himself had commissioned the ox cart uh, scenario, so he should have known better. Mm. Uh, also, you have a you know, the ark had also been in the household of um, of Uzzah for a time. So before it was transported, uh, Uzzah was already there. Uh, who knows, maybe like familiarity breeding contempt, uh, or at least taking something lightly that uh, that this, uh, you know, the one who had been there had 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 lived with the ark uh, in his midst. Uh, you know, maybe takes for granted some of the uh, holy stipulations that uh, that uh, that God had uh, had had commanded. And so, so you have. Uh, it's also interesting too that lessons should have been learned from the Philistines too, because once the ark was in Philistine territory. You know, there were people who, if, you know, Philistines who looked into the ark and, uh, and, and of course, were struck down. There were, of course, plagues associated with the, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, tumors that broke out in the Philistine, you know, in, the, in Philistine territory and so forth. So there, there's already warning. And it's very interesting that even when the ark, you know, and again, the language is, is interesting. Uh, you, if you read in 1 Samuel chapter 4, where you have the ark being taken into battle, it's kind of like a good luck charm. Uh, you know, it says, it talks about the ark ark that, you know, uh, you know, above which, you know, you know, where the, where the cherubim uh, are, are above which, you know, God is, you know, God sits. Uh, you have that same language that's used just before David has it transported. And so there's a, a kind of a mark of, this is very significant. This is very, you know, we're t- dealing with holy things here, mm-hmm. but yet they're being treated with such, kind of sl- in a, such a slipshod way, with such disregard for what God has actually stipulated should be done with this holy object. So, so again, it's, it's, there's a, 
there are all sorts of rules that are being broken here. And, uh, e- and even if the ark had fallen to the ground, it wouldn't have made the ark impure or some, some you know, the dirt is just dirt. Um, mm. But so there's no, in a sense, contamination or impurific- impurity that comes to the ark if it falls to the ground. So anyway, those are some things that are, are I think, helpful to keep in yeah. mind as we look at that kind of a context. But, you know, you know, you know, when, you know when Nadab and Abihu are struck dead for offering strange fire, uh, in uh, in Numbers chapter ten, the Lord uh, you know, says to to Aaron and, and Moses that you know those who would you know those who would approach me must treat me as holy. Right. So the closer you get to God, yeah. the better prepared you you are to be, especially in this Old Testament setting where you had all sorts of stipulations. The closer you know the high priest especially goes into the to, you know the holy of holies once a year and has a rope wrapped around his waist. In case the bell stops tingling, uh, you know, at the bottom of his robe, mm-hmm. and he's got to be pulled out because he's been struck dead. So if you get that close to God, you better be well prepared and follow all the stipulations. I mean, do you think some of these problem passages is due to a modern underappreciation of the holiness of God? Hmm. I mean, I, here's where maybe my 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 conservative background is still very much alive and well. I don't know. Like when I read the Bible, there is a deep, deep fearful concern for the holiness of God. And I know through Christ, you know, the curtain's been rent and we're in a different dispensation, but that doesn't mean God's holiness has changed. It just means our access to his holiness is profound. Like God has brought us up to him. It doesn't mean he, his holiness is, Oh, I'm not holy anymore. I'm just your buddy. Like, I don't know that, that pr- profoundness and, and, yeah, just the severity of God's holiness is, seems to be so written in Scripture, and yet that is one of the most politically incorrect things you could ever say inside and outside the church. I mean, to talk about some being that's so holy that if some people violate that, they get struck dead. Like that is, few pulpits would even preach that today. You know, like that's, yeah. is that, do you think that's part of the issue? I mean... <laughs> I think you're hitting on something very important. I mean, we operate in a world where you don't have, say, certain taboos. You don't have, you know, like, related to, you know, blood and semen and mm-hmm. uh, and and so forth. You know, that there are certain uh, certain things that we, you know, or even, you know, dead bodies and so forth. These are the sorts of things that we just kind of gloss over in Scripture. But you can imagine uh, you know, people from, you know, in you know, even if outside of Israel, in, in some of its sacred, you know, the sacred uh, cultic practices in, in other religions. Oh, you touched that, you defiled that, you went into that place yeah. without preparing yourself. I mean, these are things that are seen as you know, utterly, you know, inconceivable mm-hmm. that that you would so treat, you know, treat this with such disregard. And you're, and you're right uh, that there is a, uh, that the, the barriers have been uh, torn down. But as one of the, one of the texts that I uh, interact with quite a bit in, uh, in my forthcoming book is God of Indictive Bully is Romans eleven twenty two, still in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, behold then the kindness and severity, severity. of God. Hmm. And you look at how Jesus is proclaiming judgment upon the cities where miracles are being performed. You know, if the miracles performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have, been, would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And, and so there is a greater penalty that, the, you know, that those people from Sodom will stand up and condemn the cities of Jesus' day because the responsibility is so much greater. And, uh, and so you see that in the book of Hebrews, you know, that if, if the, you know, by the law of Moses that, you know, in, in the presence of two or three witnesses, is someone was put to death, how much more severe will it be mm. for those who uh, who trample underfoot the Son of God and so forth? So you see that great contrast. There's greater love manifested in the New Testament yeah. in Jesus Christ, displayed powerfully, beautifully, but there's also greater severity that goes along with that too. That probably explains, I mean, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, you got second coming passages like um, 2 Thessalonians 1. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, we mentioned offline, you know, Revelation two and three. I mean, Jesus, he's got some pretty harsh words, you know, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's helpful. I mean, e- and e- so even, even if there's an uneasiness in my own heart with some of these passages, that's a, that's a, part of it's like, well, that's my default should be like, 
I'm the creature, he's the creator, the uneasiness is really still my problem. I can be honest with that. I can be honest. Like even, you know, I still read the other passage and I'm like, I have a theological explanation, but they're still like, ooh, this is a little uncomfortable. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But the uncomfortableness shouldn't be, and I, I, you know, well, I can never love a God who would like just that, that, that phrase has never made sense to me. Like, what, what do you mean? Like the kind of God that even undergirds that, the very logic of that phrase shouldn't be God anyway. Like if we're the ones deciding whether we're going to love that God or not love that God, or well, if God does this, then he's out. You know, it's like, well, who's really God here in this, <laughs> in this language yeah. game we're playing. But I, I don't know. Like I, trying to wrestle with that tension of being honest with things that are, you know, troubling and yet have a better theological framework for how we view those troubling passages. But yeah. 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 And again, I, I'm not trying to, and I hope I'm not giving the impression that, uh, Oh, you know, you know, just read my books and all these problems are, yeah. are dissolved. <laughs> uh, there are still things to wrestle with things that, you know, well, I wish it could be different or toned down or something. You know, mm -hmm. that's just where I'm coming from uh, in my more modern uh, mindset. Uh, but a couple of things that are helpful. Uh, one is, of course, we, we, we're often uh, quoting C.S. Lewis these days and in, in, in the uh, Chronicles of Narnia, you know, Aslan is portrayed, the Jesus figure is portrayed as being good, but not safe. Yeah, I love that line. I think it's That's important so, yeah. to keep that, keep that in mind that Jesus is, uh, do not take Jesus lightly. I mean, his authority, uh, you know, his, you know, his, he, he can be severe mm -hmm. and we need to, you know, he, and, I, and I use the contrast of Jesus is one who both is is the, is the person who will not break a bruised reed or snuff out a mm -hmm. smoldering wick, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, Revelation twelve, he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Yeah. So you see both of those. There's the tenderness, the kindness, but there's also the severity mm -hmm. and harshness if if that is needed. Um, but also an, another, you know, I think another uh, reminder, you know, here they're just basic, uh, you know, God 101, uh, but it's good to keep in, in, in the forefront that if there is something that is evil, if there is something that is intrinsically wrong, you know, God is not going to command it. God will have a morally sufficient reason mm -hmm. for doing it, that God will be vindicated in the end, mm -hmm. and that all of our uh, maybe objections, I mean, as strong as we think they, they may be, uh, ultimately, you know, God is going to be, is not going to do something that is, uh, is, uh, is in, in, unjust. Uh, God is going to see that things are set right, uh, even if at this moment we, we can't see it. You know, like, for example, the, the practice of the, of, uh, of infant sacrifice, you know, Jeremiah several, a couple of times it says about this practice of burning your, you know, having your children pass through the fire and the Israelites imitated that. Uh, he said, I did not I did not command it, nor did it even enter my mind. Hmm. The picture being, you know, this is so far removed from me, this is so evil, that it's, it's as though I hadn't even thought about this. Where did you guys come up with this? Hmm. This is so far removed from my character. And so in the same way, we ought to recognize that if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give, give, give good th gifts to those who ask? Uh, that, so, you know, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And so whatever is, you know, whatever negativity, whatever questions we may have about, well, that just doesn't seem to square with my understanding of God. God has shown himself to be trustworthy, reliable, faithful, and good, especially in the manifestation of Jesus Christ for our behalf, laying down his life for us, sinking to the very depths so that we might be rescued. We can entrust some of those muddles and questions to him, being confident that if God is willing to go to these lengths to rescue us, mm -hmm. we can trust in his goodness, even if we can't see it in this particular question or that particular question. Super helpful. Let, let's go to one more and then... Um... We'll probably have to close out our time. Let, let's talk about women in the Old Testament. Le several passages that read from our modern Western context were like, what in the world is going on here? I feel like they're kind of clustered around Deuteronomy 21 to 24. You've got, um, you got the so-called, you know, marry your rapist laws, which I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I've, Sandy Richter has got some great thoughts on that. I think that's been mistranslated and interpreted. But you have the other prisoner of war. If you go in and conquer an enemy and you find a woman that a virgin or a, yeah, a, man, a dead soldier's Bizarre. wife that you think is good looking and you want to marry her, great. Grab her and bring her home. And just a lot of stuff that's just very foreign. And I mean, 
should be troubling to our eyes at first glance. But um, I don't know if you want to take a specific passage or a framework or how should we think through how the Old Testament views views women? Yeah. Well, in the Moral Monster book, you know, let's take the uh, the Mary Rapist uh, accusation. Um, that passage itself um, in you know both Exodus and uh, Deuteronomy you know, 22 um, is referring to a seducer. Uh, that the seducer is the one who you know it's sort of like what we'd call statutory rape, where it's it, it's not a forcible back alley kind of uh, sexual assault but someone who is seducing a, uh, a younger woman. And so the question is, well, would you want to not marry your rapist, but marry the one who seduced you? Uh, so that's a, a far different picture. Uh, and of course, in that sort of a scenario, and it's it, it, commentators generally uh, agree to this, that it's not something that's forced upon uh, the, the young woman, uh, but rather it's something that's decided upon between her uh, father and her. Uh, and you know this is you know that of course if you be, and, and then if you if he says no then he has to pay uh, double the amount of what the quote bride price would be in other words the security that was given to the woman uh, in the event of her you know husband's death that was just given uh, you know for her own security uh, to to make ends meet but uh, so he, that price would be doubled because if there is a, if, if their virginity is lost which was highly prized it was expected that one would be a virgin going into marriage. Marriage, uh, that if that was compromised, then this would leave someone's future prospects uh, looking very dim. And so that was a way of, uh, of creating, actually, a lot of these laws are actually for safety, protection, security, rather than, oh, that, you know, trying to treat women in an inferior way. It's actually, these are often very, very much protective measures. Uh, even that woman in Deuteronomy 21, who uh, is a prisoner of war, um, but there is the, uh, the possibility of, uh, of being married, uh, that, uh, that there's a month, basically, of mourning, of saying goodbye, cutting your hair, trimming your fingernails, and, uh, and shedding your clothing, uh, and, and basically a picture of adopting a new place within a new culture in Israel. Uh, and, and up until that time, there, you know, there, if, if he decides to marry her, then, then fine, he has to go through the proper protocol. But there's no such thing as, you know, marry, you know, you know, battlefield rape or something like that, that would have been prohibited in ancient Israel. In my forthcoming book, Is God a Vindictive Bully? I have, I have material on that issue of war, rape, and so forth, which, again, would have been prohibited. You know, sex was to be within a, a marriage context. And here, this is one of them preparing the way for that in Deuteronomy 21, waiting that month. And then if the marriage, uh, you know, if the, the, the desires to pursue marriage, then fine, you go through the proper protocol. Um, and again, she is not to be humiliated. So there's a regard or respect for her, uh, you know, if, if he decides not to marry her, that she is to be treated with respect. One of the things I really appreciate about your book, especially with the women passages, is um, you, you just constantly remind us of the ancient context in which these are written. And when we do have parallels to some of these laws in Deuteronomy and other passages, which we do have, right, a decent amount of parallels of other cultures and similar laws, um, if we compare them to their own culture, would you say all or at least most of the Old Testament laws, when we have a comparison, that it is a humanizing improvement upon what is going on in the culture of the day? Is that is that fair to say? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the, and I have in, in my forthcoming book, I have two chapters that look at the, the, the two, the worldview of Israel encapsulated in the, in the Mosaic law and that of other ancient law collections and that you see the worldview comparisons are striking uh, when it comes to even their concept of God, uh, when it comes to you know, helping the poor in the land, to foreigners coming in, uh, a whole host of things that I cover uh, in that chapter. And so you're right. And that's why Deuteronomy 6 says that when the Israelites are actually living out the law, the nations around them will will notice what a wise and understanding people this is. So, so the law is actually intended to, even though it doesn't, it's not bringing utopian ideals, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wholesale all at once, uh, because there are, after all, some, uh, you know, laws that are given, as Jesus says in Matthew 19, 8, because the hardness of human hearts. So, there, you know, it assumes that people will sin. It assumes that people are not going to live up to God's standards. So it's giving to us kind of a moral 
floor rather than a moral ceiling mm. uh, here. But God is meeting the people where they are. He's giving them, uh, he's reminding them of the biblical vision in Genesis 1 and 2, and also meeting them halfway uh, and pointing them in, in a redemptive direction. So you see over and over again various aspects of redemption here, there, in comparison to the rest of the ancient Near Eastern law collection. So it really is striking, and I, uh, and I, and I highlight that all the more in this forthcoming book. And one of the, I, to me, one of the the most helpful things in your first book, or the, is God a moral monster, and it's something that I, I've I have since seen in lots of different Old Testament scholarship uh, treatments is is this kind of ethical trajectory. And you you even said it the phrase, and I've, I've used this phrase probably again probably got it from you that you know God is meeting Israel where they're at, and slowly kind of bringing them toward a more ideal place where you know that's why we had this trajectory coming from like the law of Moses leading up to say the Sermon on the Mount or the New Testament, a, a more Christian ethic so that it, it isn't improving upon ancient cultures. Clearly, if you look at the historical background, but it, even still, it's not the ultimate ideal. It's a step toward that ideal re yeah. revealed in the New Testament. Well, um, Paul, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. I just want to give another shout out to uh, your, your book is God a moral monster and your forthcoming book. Uh, coming out in October, is God a vindictive bully? Do you think somebody, if somebody hasn't read Moral Monster, should they read that one first? Like, is, is uh, your 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 vindictive bully book is 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 that building on is God a moral monster, or could somebody just go, jump straight to this uh, other book? Yeah, you could jump straight into it, but what I do in, especially toward the latter part of the, the book, is I build on things that I said in the Moral Monster book regarding women, slaves, servitude, uh, and also warfare. So uh, I can't cover, uh, I don't want to repeat myself too much, so I, it, it, I see them as complementary okay. volumes. Uh, without having a significant overlap. So I'm trying to avoid that. So I think both they're like companion volumes, but but you can read them independently, but I think it's helpful to read them in sequence. Uh, you know, is God a moral monster first? And then of course going into the warfare thing, if you want to uh, add, you know, is God, you know, you know, did God really command genocide, which uh, adds more. And then uh, and then the vindictive bully book. I, I do have one more quick question before I let you go. I, sure. Criticism against is God a moral monster? I, what would be some of the top critiques? And is there anything where you're like, ah, that's a, that's actually a good point. I might need to change my mind on that or. Um... Right. Yeah. And I, what I, and this is another reason to uh, perhaps read the moral monster book first is because I've done some tweaking and, and modifications. So I, I have it, I have several chapters on punishments in the old Testament yeah. and in, in the law, which sounds severe, burning, stoning, etc. And uh, I've come to see that rather than taking these literally, although I do note that 15 out of the 16 potential death penalty you know, uh, cases mm -hmm. uh, or scenarios can be commuted to pay monetary payment. So I acknowledge that. Uh, but one of the things that I do note is that people in the ancient Near East, including Israel, probably didn't see stoning, burning, and so forth as literal, but basically a way to alert people to saying, this is bad avoid it. And so I go into detail on how, for example, adultery, which is potentially punishable by death, but it's often, um, you know, it's typically handled through monetary payment or families resolving it between themselves. Hmm. But you don't see adultery being capitally punished in within the law of Moses, nor do you see it uh, outside the law of Moses too. And so I, I basically look at the, uh, the, you know, the law of Moses uh, and then what's happening outside the law of Moses to see how these the commands, these ca potential capital punishment commands are handled. So, so anyway, I, I go into a lot more detail there. And so I see a lot of hyperbole and exaggeration in those. And so that's a little bit of a departure from what I had done earlier. Okay. That's super helpful. Yeah. Well, Paul, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah. I'm really excited about this next book. I'll have to, maybe I reach out to you, have your publisher send me a, a free copy. I always like to get free books. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, great to be with you. And thanks so much, Preston. Always a pleasure. My pleasure. Okay.